All right, welcome again uh, to the third Smart Grid Educational Series Seminar. The focus uh, today is distributed energy resources. We just heard from Francis Cleveland a presentation that talked not just about the bits and bytes, but also about the stability of the grid as larger and larger percentages of distributed energy resources are integrated into the grid. And there are a few things that are very important to understand here. One is that while initially distributed energy resources were seen just like that, resources that were out there in a distributed way, the image of distributed energy resources has changed dramatically in the last few years, especially as the projection for energy consumption from the EIA shows growth over the next 10, 20, 30 years. And yet when we look at what sources of energy are available to us, the traditional hydro and coal and nuclear, if you think of it in terms of the growth for them. The current environmental, economic, and political climate is making it very difficult to put a lot of coal plants out there or to put a lot of nuclear power plants. And even if we could, the congestion that would exist on the transmission lines in certain parts of the country would make it very difficult to take full benefit of th those sources of energy. Trying to increase the transmission line capacity is also an uphill battle because you have to get access rights of way on land and it involves a lot of public hearings and it's a very sensitive subject. It's that not in my backyard kind of concept. So distributed energy resources are being revisited. It's kind of like Kellogg's Corn Flakes, taste it again for the first time. So we had people who had solar panels and, and other sources of energy over a long period of time, but they were kind of all out there in little amounts and people basically served themselves. But we are challenging society in a new way now with distributed energy. We are saying not only will this take care of your needs, as Frances described her home with an almost net zero type of situation, except for the $5 of access charges, but we are also going to count on you to provide this resource, not only in terms of delivering kilowatt hours, but also volt VAR support, which basically means ultimately grid stability. And that there are a lot of ancillary services and Francis went over in her presentation to do that. So it's very, very important for us to understand that when hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, are going to involve themselves in becoming prosumers from being consumers. In other words, they're going to deliver electricity as well as receive, that you can't have something like that in a haphazard way. It's not enough just to say, I have electrical and mechanical integration and I'm done. Because the DER is going to become an increase larger and larger percentage of the overall energy mix, and you cannot just rely on grid resiliency to absorb the intermittent aspect of DER. You have to do it in a responsible way, which means you need to put the appropriate amounts of storage, you need to have the appropriate demand response to shape the load to match the distributed energy resource supply and things like that. That requires an understanding of communications. It uh, requires an understanding of interoperability standards, not just for communication, but for the application for exchange of data. And it also involves storing the data and just the right amount of data so that you can do real-time operations with it. You don't want to just take bulks and bulks of petabytes and petabytes of data and encrypt it all and put it away, and then every time you need it for something, now you have to do a decrypt of petabytes of data in order to run a SQL query. So you have to architect these databases properly. You have to do the management of data. And we're talking about matching data with levels of Yahoo and Google here. I mean, we're talking petabytes of data. This is not 
megabytes, not gigabytes, not terabytes, we're talking petabytes, you know, 10 to the 15th type of power. Keep this in mind, and that's why there were no alcoholic beverages served at break time, <laughs> because it requires a very sober thought. This was all deliberate. <laughs> and I gave you some sugar to, you know, <laughs> give your brains a little bit of excitement. But keep this in mind, that this complex array of solar and wind and storage and electric vehicles is not going to work unless we have a modular approach, a layered approach, that we have the proper semantics so that when it's field equipment, we run the appropriate protocols for that. When it is back-end uh, reporting and uh, tracking and things, there's a different kind of model. And that the various individuals, whether it's a consumer or an ISO or a distribution company, whoever the player is, aggregator, that the language that they're speaking and the credentials that they're presenting in this transaction be standard. Because if they are not, we're going to have chaos on our hands. And so what Francis was trying to do for the better part of an hour is lay out the structure of such an infrastructure. Did you notice there was that diagram that had all the standards on the GWAC stack laid out? I mean, it's, it's a very humbling experience, visual experience, because behind it are hours and hours of labor and lots of arguments and tons of coffee consumed from many, many cafes in many cities, not just in the United States, but globally, and, and Francis will tell you that. And a few beers. And <laughs> beers, yes. Yes, yes. I have to tell the webinar people, Francis said beers. Okay. <laughs> yes, beers. <laughs> okay. So just keep this, uh, these thoughts in mind, that this is not, as I said before the break, a luxury that is a nice to have. No, this is coming to a theater near you, and as I said, there's the nice way and then the hard way. I prefer the nice way, because in the nice way, we have the window of opportunity to work as a team, come up with consensus. We have very diverse backgrounds, and this is where seminars like this are gonna be very important because this is the interface with the lay population. This is where people who have had experiences in, let's say, healthcare and telecom and others can come in into this sector and help us shape this because anyone who knows how to use a credit card or an ATM machine knows that these things have been worked out in other verticals about how you inform exchange information. That today I can go to any country out there and run my ATM card and get local currency. Now I have the privilege of being accompanied by some real experts who are spending a big part of their current careers in distributed energy resources in various ways, talking very creatively, out of the box, out of many boxes actually. <laughs> so I have uh, Craig Lewis, who is part of the Clean Coalition. This is uh, trade organization whose job is to explain the compelling arguments for DER and work with state and federal agencies to make sure that the barriers to the penetration of DER on the grid are removed. And he spends a lot of time with his team articulating that to the California Public Utility Commission and many other organizations in the United States. And then we have Ed Caslett. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Ed, the nice thing about Ed is that you cannot pull anything over Ed because he's been there, he's either worked on it or heard someone who's worked on it and probed him enough. He's very, very sharp. And that's why I like in bringing him into discussions because I know you're going to get an honest assessment of the situation with Ed. And his experience and his contributions, especially in the state of California and in the policies of California, are really, really praiseworthy. So thank you, Ed, for coming to our session. And then, of course, Francis, I've already introduced. So what I want to do is start with Ed, because he's got a PowerPoint presentation, 
and he wants to make some introductory remarks, and then we will go into uh, the uh, more detailed Q&A in the panel form. So, Ed, if you could please step up here. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you, Irfan. Uh, so I'm going to talk, uh, Frances laid uh, the groundwork for what I'm going to talk about very well. Uh, she mentioned the lower layers of her hierarchy, where it's all control, and higher layers where you have the utilities and the uh, uh, various parties involved, and she described it as a very difficult problem. And so I'm going to talk about that, that problem primarily and how it interfaces uh, with the lower levels. I call this transactive energy or price responsive uh, uh, dis distributed energy resources. Um, so Go to full screen. We can go to full screen. Okay. So um, I, I've been around the industry for a long time. I've, I've worked on uh, these methods. Uh, I, I spent uh, several years at the, on the Board of Governors, the California Independent System Operator. I founded an online transaction system for electric power called Automated Power Exchange and been consulting in this area for many, many years. One of the little boxes on top of Francis's chart of standards was a committee called EMIX, Energy Market Information Exchange. I was co-chair of that committee and there we're trying to define when you're communicating about price and when you're doing transactions on the grid, how do you standardize that communication? What's the price? What's the quantity? What, am I, what is the product or the thing I'm talking about? When does the power delivery start? When does it end? How do I measure all of that in a standardized way that can be interoperate with all the other standards that everybody's working with? So that's the EMIX standard. Within that, I developed a subset of that for automated transactions on the grid called TMIX, Transactive Energy Market Information Exchange. This EMIX standard, including TMIX, is now part of the NIST catalog of standards, and so the work I just described today utilizes that. Um, so the current way uh, we attempt to, or we plan to manage uh, DER is uh, through three, uh, three approaches. I'd call them the sacred cows of power system operation. Uh, one is we'll do it by command and control by the distribution operators and ISO operators. There's Francis mentioned there's too many devices uh, uh, to work with. It gets really complicated. You've got the Internet of Everything coming along, where essentially everything that uses power will have an IPv6 address on it, be capable of two-way communications, including when you charge your iPhone, your, your, uh, your PCs, and so on. So everything will be connected uh, and able to be manage its own power, in some cases deliver power back to the grid. Too much information is needed for central control for this, uh, and then who should control? We have the case of what happens if a uh, distribution operator says, I need more power, and the, the ISO says, I need less power. Who wins? How do you handle that uh, conflict? And the fundamental problem is customers want to live their own lives. They don't like to be controlled. So tell them what you're going to pay, pay them or what, what they're going to get paid, and then they, make, they can make their own decisions. And if we get the prices right and the transactions right and so on, then it will solve the problem for the overall grid. The other approach is, well, we'll use uh, uh, our current tariffs and, uh, and demand response to do this. Well, our current tariffs are an all-you-can-eat option. In other words, you get as much power as you want at a given price. Often it's a flat price. Okay, we, we, sometimes it's a tiered price. The more you use and eat over the month, the higher price you pay. Very complicated. Uh, we, sometimes people want to say, well, we'll change it to time of use price. So on peak and off peak, it's different prices. But it's still, uh, there's no uh, effective price signal there other than on or off peak. And there's a whole bunch of other approaches, including demand response events, where the system operator might say, I need you to curtail or produce more power and then issue an event and pay you for that response. Now, all of this, this gets very complicated, and essentially you're turning more control of your life over to the system operators. They're beginning to treat you like virtual power plants or like ISO generators. In fact, they use the same software for dispatching you as they do the big power plants. So uh, if you're running a, a utility, a distribution system, you're trying to sell power, you want to treat your customers like their customers, not like their generators. 
And so, so it's much better if we can just pay people for what they deliver to you or make them pay, ask them to pay a price and they choose what to do in a way that's the way every other commodity is managed in our society. We don't have a central control operator for setting the price and the quantities of tomatoes. It's all done through various markets. Now, people say electricity is different and that's fine. And when we put demand response in, the question is, well, if you're going to get people against what baseline? So you have to measure a baseline, more complex. The utility state is becoming extremely complex, costly, and it takes many, many years to implement these costly systems. That's a sacred cow too. Third one is, well, we can solve all this by just broadcasting price signals. Turn the consumer advocacy, well, this is called roller coaster pricing. The price would be up and down. The poor ladies in the rest homes won't understand what's going on. Another problem is these after the fact prices. In other words, the price is what they sold power for in the market five minutes ago or an hour ago. So the price you actually pay will be different from the price they're able to broadcast. People study this and say, well, this is going to be unstable. You raise the price because there's a shortage. Everybody responds. You've got a deficit. You've got a deficit. The price goes up. I'm sorry, I got the first one around. But you get the idea. And you get these oscillations. Underdance. Yeah. Exactly. And then, of course, if we have all the prices based on spot prices, there's too much risk. That's why the California thing collapsed. So I believe we've got to slowly retire these sacred cows over time. Can't get rid of them immediately. Still need the milk. And get to the next phase, which is operating it using automated, what I call tenders and transactions, just the way we operate other markets when we do it at high speed and take advantage of electronic e-commerce systems we've already developed. So the fundamental idea in this is there's a tender, which is an offer to buy or sell power. It can be for a year, a month, a day, an hour, five minutes, or four seconds. That's the duration. There's a quantity associated. So we don't just give a price. We say the system operator says, I'll buy 100 megawatts from a party or 100 kilowatts from a party, and here's the price I'll pay. It doesn't say I'll buy an infinite amount at the price because that would be unstable. This is how we get this to work. And you can decide to buy or sell a location. You've got to say where it is on the grid, different prices, different places. There's a start time for each purchase or sale and an end time or a duration. And then when you make an offer, it might expire after five minutes or five days or five seconds. It turns out what you will – and you make offers ahead of time. So I make an offer for power five minutes from now, ten minutes from now, 15 minutes from now, two hours from now. You tend to make a lot of small, frequent offers and update them. That works best. The parties, the distributed energy resources, the building owners, that sort of thing, they'll accept those tenders if they want to. They can also make tenders, offers to sell back to the grid or buy from the grid. The accepted tenders become transactions. The sum up the transactions for a given interval of time, that's a position. It's like a schedule. And it tells what the usage of the power will be at a particular time. All this can be completely automated. The set of forward tenders gives you a forward price curve. If I know the forward price curve, I can take storage, for example, and say, okay, the price is going to be high 15 minutes from now, and it's low now. I can make money buying power now and dispatching it later on. And I can book that profit. The price has changed later. I can redo it. All this is done automatically. So I get the actionable forward price curves and the DR system self-dispatch, maximizing the profits to the customers, still observing all the physics of the local connection and all that sort of thing. And the T&D operators also use these tenders for transmission elements or distribution elements to help make sure that all of the prices you pay and the tenders you do take care of all the grid constraints. So this is an overview of the – you put this together on a platform, and the green are a set of DER technologies. And any party can transact with any other party using tenders and accepting transactions. 
The process goes from, you can have an indication, which is not a binding offer, a tender, which is a binding offer to buy or sell. If it's accepted as a transaction, that goes into position, then that position just for delivery is compared to the meter, and the difference becomes another transaction to pay for any excess or not. All automated, and below you have the set of web services information. This particular platform is up and running. It's been running for six months up in the Microsoft cloud. Sorry, not the IBM cloud. And it runs continuously and automatically. So I'll give you a couple examples of how it applies. Okay. You can use it for what's called two-part dynamic pricing. So we're going to be going through a whole revision out of our tariffs here in California, according to the PUC. And so on the, as you face it, on the right side shows the response to actual real-time tenders. Okay. And as the price is high, the load goes down. The first side is a forward transaction to buy, say, an off-peak block of power and on-peak block of power at a fixed price. And so what you pay in real time is just the difference between the, you pay only the spot price or get the spot price only for the difference between what you actually use in real time in the forward situation. So this is an example of a sequence of transactions, in this case two over time, which means you've got a forward hedge, you've got a forward commitment. It minimizes your risk and it minimizes risk to the utility. The other case is a little micro-grid or local grid issue here. I suppose it's, you know, Atherton or Los Alamos Hills or whatever, and you have a cul-de-sac that's got a 50-kilowatt transformer. And everybody has solar panels and they have a 50-kilowatt peak. So you can see if nobody's home and nobody's charging, that's going to exceed the transformer in the reverse direction. Now, one of them brings home a Tesla, which charges 20 kilowatts if you want to do it in four hours. And, you know, all the neighbors get hooked and they all buy a Tesla. So I've got five Teslas. Well, you know, I could charge each of them at 10 kilowatts and they could all charge at the same time as long as everything else balances out. So pretty complicated little cul-de-sac here. Okay, and of course, if you've got a Tesla, you don't want to be told when you can charge it and when you don't, right? And you'll pay a large amount of money if you've got to use it to show off. And you probably don't cooperate with your neighbors all that well. So the way you handle this problem is you create a subscription for each homeowner who gets 10 kilowatts of that transformer. Okay? And he owns that. And then you have a, I'll just say it very quickly, an algorithm such as if they all try to use too much of that transformer in one direction or another, if they're all trying to charge at the same time, there's not enough solar coming out. Okay? The price goes up. Okay? And so those people who are using more than 10 kilowatts pay those who are using less. Okay? So no extra money goes to the utility. It's just a transfer within the cul-de-sac. And so this is the amount of use on that, of course, depends on what the sun's doing and that sort of thing. The price is really high because there's a lot of charging going on. You know, some people decide not perhaps to run their air conditioners at that point in time. All that can be automated on this cul-de-sac using the transactive approach. So that's pretty much it. You can apply that up at the higher levels of the grid. And it works the same. T-Mix is my company. We build these platforms, deploy them as a service. Usually cloud, we can sell the platform to the utility. They can put it behind their firewall. So this is a system that you can implement all these transactive services for managing microgrids and DER and doing tariffs to homeowners and doing transmission pricing. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Ed. So you're seeing the layered approach. Francis had the guts of the utility, the comms, FIMAC layer, comms layer, application layer. Now on top of that is the business transaction that needs to occur. And the key thing, if there's one thing you can take away from Ed's presentation, 
is that he's removing the element of hysteria in dynamic pricing. There's one message you want to take away. By having this concept of a subscription, he's saying you pretty much know about how much energy you're going to use going forward. Make a contract so the company that's delivering you that electricity knows and can plan appropriately. And then you're just working on the margins. If you spend a little more, you pay the price at that time for just that amount. So, so <laughs> then <laughs> at that point, you're not overreacting. Because if all the energy you were using at that time was at that price, you would overreact. Because then you don't want to pay all that price. Similarly, if you're using less than what you were planning on doing, then you get benefit of that because the other person or whoever is in the community who's using more will pay you, as Ed was saying. So this transactive concept, what it does is it reduces, as I said, the hysteria, so the volatility of price and the instability that it'll create in the grid gets diminished. He's putting essentially an attenuator on the response. It's adding inertia into the market a little bit. All right, so now we have Craig Lewis from the Clean Coalition who will make some prepared remarks, and then we're going to go into an interactive Q&A for the panel. So Craig? Thank you, uh, real pleasure to be here. The Clean Coalition is a nonprofit organization. We're, we're not a trade organization, as Irfan had said originally. We're a, we're a nonprofit, uh, and we operate totally independently from industry, in, in industry parties. Um, and our mission is to implement policies and programs that accelerate the transition to a decentralized energy system. And the reason we care about that, about getting to a decentralized energy system, is a lot of the reasons that were talked about by Francis and Irfan and, and Ed, um, but I basically summarize it as because it's cheaper, we can get there faster, and we can get there safer. And when I say safer, we can get there with a much more uh, intelligent um, uh, energy system that has a minimal environmental impact. We don't have to go building transmission all over the place. Uh, we can get there uh, with much more energy security. So if that, if that transmission line goes down or if that central station power plant goes down, guess what? We can still keep our lights on and more importantly, we can keep the hospitals running and the water pumps running and all of those vital services that actually really matter if the power goes down. Um, so uh, the, 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 the Clean Coalition came about um, through uh, it wasn't, it wasn't a planned organization, um, and, and I founded it about three and a half years ago, but my, most of my career has been in the telecommunications business and on the business side. I've been all about, you know, out there uh, uh, finding out how to, how to get wireless uh, telecommunications systems deployed around the world, and, and it's been a fun, fun time, and I work for big companies like Qualcomm and Ericsson and work with some small startups as well that you've probably never heard of. Uh, but that was a really fun ride, and, and, and so I've always liked to be on the, on the leading edge of, of technology. Um, and got into, the, got into the, the, the government relations side of telecommunications, and, and telecommunications is really similar to the energy space. You've got a really big industry that is dominated by monopolies that are allowed to operate under a regulatory compact, which means that they are allowed to operate as monopolies, as long as they agree to be regulated by an entity that's looking out for the best interests of, of all of us, the ratepayers. And so uh, going from telecom government relations to the, the renewable energy or the energy uh, government relations is, is actually a really easy transition. Um, and my transition into the energy space was through Steve Wesley's gubernatorial campaign. Uh, Steve Wesley, former controller here in California, uh, was running for governor back in the 2006 election cycle, and I was his energy policy guy. And doing the energy policy for a gubernatorial candidate in a major state like California, you can imagine that you're expected to look around the world for best practices, because my mandate was 
find out the policies that we need to implement in California to make sure that California is a leader in the transition to a smart energy future and make sure that California reaps the economic benefits of that transition. Because we're talking about the single largest market in the world, $6 trillion annual market is the energy business worldwide. So if you lead in the energy business going into the, going into the, from now into the future, you are going to have a very healthy economy. So that was, a very, that was my mandate working for Steve Wesley. Now, unfortunately, Steve uh, didn't get into the governor's office yet. <laughs> and so I had to go to plan B. My plan B was to become a renewable energy project developer. And I was quite successful at that. I got the very first solar project through California's Renewables Portfolio Standard Program. That was a, that's the good news. The bad news is that that project, as well as the additional couple of dozen renewable energy projects that I've worked on, were all like putting a man on the moon. They were so freaking difficult. It was really pathetic that we have to, you know, we are, the people who are out there taking risks, making investments, doing the work to make this transition to a distributed energy system are basically having to bang their head against the wall and just go through very painful processes. We need to, so what that told me is that I knew all the policies that we needed to implement because I looked around the world. I had found him working for Steve Wesley. We'd really done a good job of looking around the world for best practices in terms of how do you procure, how do you interconnect, and how do you finance those solutions that are going to get us to a distributed or a decentralized energy system. And so uh, I just got, I had enough of the, of the, the broken policies and I, I, said, I looked around, I thought there's really well-funded organizations out there, companies like IBM, you know, it, nobody was going to, to nobody was really taking um, the effort and, and making the investment to do the policy innovation that needed to happen. And so I raised my hand, formed the Clean Coalition, and that's what we're about, is implementing the policies and programs to accelerate the transition to a distributed energy system, or excuse me, decentralized energy system, and to do it as, as really as fast as we can in an intelligent manner. Um, the, uh, so I, I talked about the solutions that, 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 that really need to get solved. Um, so the policy needs to innovate to make sure that we can get procurement, that we can get so you can procure the energy and the intelligent grid solutions like energy storage and demand response. So you gotta, you gotta, you've got to have a way for the utilities to procure those solutions. Uh, you've got you've to solve the interconnection. Interconnection is just as hard for a developer. If you want to develop a, 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 a wholesale distributed generation project, this means that you are interconnected to the distribution grid, selling your energy to the utility. It's wholesale. You're selling all of your energy to the utility. If you want to interconnect a wholesale distributed generation project in California or anywhere else around the country, it is a major nightmare to get the utility to, to, to buy that energy from you. It's an equally big nightmare to get the utility to interconnect that project to the grid. So we've got to solve both of those problems. And then financing those, those solutions, financing that distributed energy, financing the intelligent grid solutions like energy storage is, is the third big barrier. So we've got to innovate the policies to make sure that there is a way for developers of those solutions to get paid. And they've got to get paid enough that they're going to go do it because nobody is going to develop these projects to lose money, right? Developers, they might be hard-headed, they might be stubborn, but they are not stupid. And you have to be stupid to develop projects that put millions of dollars into something you're going to lose your, your, your money on. So <clears throat> um, we've got to solve procurement, interconnection, financing. Now, the Clean Coalition has been very successful at developing programs to solve the procurement and the interconnection pieces of the puzzle. We have, uh, you may have heard of uh, some of the Clean Local Energy Accessible Now programs. They're called CLEAN programs is the acronym. CLEAN programs have been adopted now by Palo Alto, Los Angeles, Long Island Power Authority, which is one of the largest utilities in, in the country. Um, Los Angeles is the largest uh, municipal utility in the country. Uh, Long Island is, is uh, it, it's like second or third. Um, so we, and Sacramento had, had implemented one a, a couple years ago. Uh, Gainesville, Florida has implemented one. We're working with about a dozen additional utilities around the country 
to implement these clean programs. And clean programs basically solve the procurement problem, streamline the procurement process so that wholesale DG projects can be bought, the energy can be sold to the utility, and they streamline the interconnection process. So we got the two biggest barriers. And when you solve those two big barriers, the financing also gets solved because now investors are willing to play in this game when you take all the risk out of it, uh, it because the, right now the way it works in most utilities is the procurement and the interconnection are huge risk factors and the, and the investors don't want to play there or they charge you massive amounts of money to, uh, for, the, for the rents on their, on their investment. Um, so we were very successful with clean programs. We worked with dozens of utilities around the country and some of the utilities started to say, hey, when we start to get to penetration levels of our distributed renewable energy of 10, 15, 20 percent, what are we going to do? Because now we're going to have situations where the majority of our energy at certain parts of the day, like think of solar, if you have if you have 10 percent of your energy on a distribution grid coming from solar, there are actually times in your day where you might have 50, 60, 70 percent of your energy coming from solar. Right? If 10 percent of the total load is coming from solar, there's points in the day you're going to have far more than 10 percent coming from solar. So what we decided we needed to go do, in addition to all of the policy work that we do, we need to go out and we need to show these utilities that we've got the solutions available today. The technology is not the barrier. The technology is available today. What's broken, what's not available, is the policy to make these technologies come to market. We've got to, we've got to innovate the policies. But in order to get the policymakers at the California Public Utilities Commission, for example, here in California, to understand that we can do this without breaking the grids, we have to get some deployments. So we've got a, what we call a DG, Distributed Generation Plus Intelligent Grid Initiative. And that initiative is to take five utilities around the country, one of which is in California, and deploy, we're going to take a single substation and we're going to get 25% of the total energy that is served by that substation from distributed solar, from wholesale distributed generation solar that is interconnected to the grid within that substation, 25%. That means at some points in time we're going to have 100%, maybe more than 100% of the total energy need on that part of the grid coming from distributed solar. And we're going to show that we can get 25% of the total load from that substation from distributed renewable energy resources and sprinkle in just enough intelligent grid solutions like some demand response and some energy storage so that the grid reliability is either maintained or improved. So this is a show me. This, this, this DG plus IG initiative is a show me. And to show me for the policymakers, most importantly, because we need the policymakers to force the investor-owned utilities to move, and and they're just not moving fast enough on their own. So um, we've got five utilities we're working with around the country. We're going to have the plans done by the end of this year, and then we will do the deployments in 2013. So by the end of 2013, we will have five showcases around the country, so that not only utilities across, policymakers and utilities across the country, but across the world can, can come and see how to actually go do this without, you know, the, the, the sky is not going to fall, and, and we're going to make sure of that. So um, I think with that, I'll, I'll save it for Q&A. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Craig, and uh, apologies for calling you a C6 when you were a C3. <laughs> 501. <laughs> so now you've heard the different aspects of distributed energy resources. Craig made the point that it's not, technology is not the primary hurdle, that there is a human element which comes in through policies, it comes through business process, and it also comes through education and awareness. And this is why I'm making this a part of this educational series because the purpose is that when you leave from here that you're carrying a little more information and know-how about the subject than when you walked in. So I'd like a show of hands of those of you who felt that experience today, that 
you're going to take back more than what you came in with. <laughs> All right. Mission accomplished. <laughs> Uh, it should be on an aircraft carrier or something <laughs> to say something <laughs> like that. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what I'm doing is uh, we're going to go till 10 after 7 because we had a break and we started late. But I want to give people an opportunity to ask questions. I think uh, Craig did a pretty good job of uh, talking about some of the hurdles that are in the way. And uh, Francis also mentioned some of the challenges, uh, whether it is still in elementary stage of the development of the object model, and then the adoption of the object model by vendors, you know, and then what you'd call the next generation of SCADA systems that would use the 61850 protocol with all of its bells and whistles. And then, ultimately, how do the independent power producers connect with all of that? Because you could have a utility have a 61850 implementation, but then you want to make sure that all the independent power producers, in order to provide the situational awareness back to the utility, and also for the IPPs to know what the utility is expecting from them, that exchange cannot just be at IEEE 1547.1 and .2. You need to go up to 3, 4, and then you also got to have that object model for 61850 understood on both sides. So those are some of the techie, geeky challenges. And then, uh, Ed, I think you made the point about with the transactive energy that there is this aspect with when you have DER that the supply of electricity will vary. And so you have to kind of follow the load, basically, with that supply if you don't want to have brownouts and blackouts. So maybe you may want to come here, if you could respond to the following question, that <clears throat> until all these systems are there with all the layers of connection, what are some things that consumers can do that are getting involved in the DER business to help move it in the direction of having the, let's say, the load follow the supply? What are some of the things that we could do? Well, um, you know, I think to solve the big problem, you need to speak up in the policy debates, and particularly with respect to the consumer advocates that uh, work with the PUC and the legislature, so that they understand that you're concerned about distributed uh, energy resources and how you can manage them yourself in order to help the grid. And that has to do with things like the tariffs you pay. The tariffs you pay provide you no incentive to properly manage your own. You don't know when to help the grid and when you can't. So there's not much you can do. Now, you can try and manage your own system so that, you know, you build a, build a system so that you uh, uh, use more of your electricity if you've got solar when the, when the sun is shining. But right now, the incentive is to sell it back, as, uh, as Francis does, on peak and buy it back, uh, buy it back even more at a lower price off peak. And that's you know, not a bad incentive, but it doesn't always work uh, the right way. So, um, and the, 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 so it, it's really hard right now. The policies need to be fixed, but you know how to help the grid. Okay. So, uh, Francis, we have a lot of people here who are looking to starting careers in this space, both in the room as well as on the webinar. You've been in this business for a while and you've worked on it from different angles. Uh, recommend some ways in which people could get into the workforce in this area, in DER and, and uh, building skill sets here where they could be helpful, whether it's in the NIST work or OpenSG work or uh, other endeavors that you're involved in. Okay. Um, actually, what I'd also like to do is take an opportunity to um, actually add something uh, to the discussion that we've been having on the money side and the policy side. And it's because although I think utilities are sometimes demonized 
by the fact that they won't do things. <laughs> uh, the, the, one of the problems is that when they were deregulated, uh, the regulated portion are the wires company. They have zero incentive. They don't get any money from putting, having DER systems added to their uh, grid. And in fact, all they get is headaches. You saw the one diagram where they've got all of these systems that they've now got to put in in order to be able to manage it. So it is a problem uh, that the grid people who are reluctant are reluctant because they do not have the money to do it and they have no real benefit with the policies as they stand right now. <clears throat> and so it's a question of policies that also have to benefit these wires companies. So it is a two-way way street on that spec point. When you say the wires companies, are you talking about those bankers from distribution? Yes, yes. Um, yeah, it's sort of a shorthand because there's the generation companies. It used to be that they were all vertically integrated. And so a company like PG&E owned all of their own generation or most of it. Um, and so, you know, if something, if some generation aspect was beneficial to them, it made sense. Now, because they're all they are wires companies, the generation is completely off the table. It, it has no impact on them, the buying and selling of generation. So it's partly this, this structure of the decent, uh, degener, uh, <laughs> de <laughs> degeneration. Yeah, I was thinking, yeah, it really is the right word, degeneration. <laughs> well, I've just made up a new word. So, um, are there best practices in other parts of the world where the P&D companies have incentive to bring in their users? Well, uh, in many parts of the company, country and, and the um, world, uh, the, the utilities are still vertically integrated. Uh, and so there really isn't that sort of disincentive um, involved. And I think that is one of the, the differences. Like in, say, Europe, um, you know, there's a huge incentive for the utilities to uh, support the DER um, integration. So it, it really does make a difference in that respect. So on the workforce development issue, Francis. Can I add one thing to the discussion? Oh, sure. You know, the Clean Coalition totally agrees with what Francis just said, which, you know, if you distill her main message there is that we've got to find a way to make sure that the utilities are incentivized financially also to participate in this transition to a decentralized energy system. It is not going to happen without the utilities participating. That, that, that much is clear. So, um, and I'm just going to elaborate on one of the thing, one of the points that Francis made, which is that the utilities are not only not incentivized to participate in this transition, they are de-incentivized, disincentivized. And the reason that they're disincentivized is that one of the ways that they make a boatload of money is on transmission investments. So the utilities love the traditional model, which is central generation, these big power plants out in the middle of nowhere, you got to build transmission to take that energy from where you're, where you're, you're producing it to where you're actually going to consume it. If you look at the amount of money that California ratepayers are going to pay in addition for transmission-related charges over the next 20 years, these are avoidable charges if we go to a distributed energy system, $80 billion dollars over the next 20 years. That's the differential. That's the amount of money that is on the table that we can save by changing the policies and moving to or taking some of that $80 billion and investing it in a decentralized energy system rather than a centralized energy system, which means that there's going to be a boatload of, of uh, there's going to be billions of dollars invested in transmission and those billions of dollars get a 12, 11 to 12 percent rate of return on them. There's nothing that pays 12% rate of return nowadays, right? It, unless you're a utility. If, if you get an approved capital expenditure, you get your 12%. Year after year, and those are 50-year amortizing investments, so it's just cash year after year after year for five decades. 
So um, the utilities are very much disincentivized. And you, to combine with the fact that they make so much money on the transmission side, they actually only get to socialize the cost. They only get to put the transmission investments into the rate base. They do not get to put distribution grid investments into the rate base because if I'm a project developer and I interconnect to the transmission grid, the utility gets to pay for the transmission associated with that. It's called the system upgrade. And it gets socialized across all the rate payers. So the utility is very happy with that. If I interconnect to the distribution grid, I pay. I pay for the NIST system upgrade, and the utility will never reimburse me, and the rate payer will never pay for that. The, the rate payer gets a free upgrade if I, for, for projects that get inter interconnected to the distribution grid. So we've got it. This is just an absolutely ludicrous situation that is going on, and we need policy innovation to fix it. Yeah, yeah, I, but I think the tech. This is not like putting somebody on the moon. This is this is this is pretty understandable, basic right. science stuff. So you, you take some of that eighty billion dollars and direct it toward distributed, you know, decentralized energy system, and this is going to go real smooth. But we got to get the policy right to re to repoint that eighty billion dollars to where where we actually want it to go in the future. Yeah, and just uh, one point on that is that. With deregulation and having generation separate from transmission, separate from distribution, it makes the situation worse because those transmission companies may not necessarily have to face the environmental policies on the centralized generation of electricity, which may be very unfriendly. So they will get their money back for investing in the transmission line, and the generation company has to do their own thing in dealing with the Sierra Clubs and others for the carbon footprint that they're producing. So if, because then what happens is the next step then is very large centralized renewable energy sources. And then you have the same problem again with transmission congestion and all of that. So what we're trying to do through this educational process is talk about the inevitability of distributed energy resources. Mm -hmm. And that if we take a proactive approach, both <coughs> in policy, in business process, in technology, we'll have the window of opportunity to do it in a sensible manner and not wait till the 11th hour because as you've seen from all that has been presented, that if we ignore it, that ostrich example that I gave, at the 11th hour we won't have some of the options we currently have in our hands. So that's the key takeaway today is that there are many opportunities for you to invest your intellect through jobs, consulting, and other things, and through being part of public hearings and all of that. Be part of it. Don't lose hope on DER because it's our only hope. Uh, Greg. Yeah, um, so what we were just discussing is how uh, um, the utilities are disincentive uh, to, because of the, it's not a vertical market anymore. The, the utility is not generating. They are transmitting, uh, they're just bringing it from the generators to Same thing. Same thing? Yeah, so uh, the question for those who are on the webinar is uh, Greg was asking what the distinction is uh, between supply and demand as, uh, with PGE and this discussion we were having about the deregulation and, and the decoupling. Okay, so and the answer was there is no difference. Thing. Yes, we're, we're. Oh, I was. Yeah, go. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want Francis, I actually, I want all three of you to share your perspectives because this workforce development is a very important thing, especially in, at a time like this when the economy is slow. A lot of people are unemployed with very good skills. I would really want them to see how they can get into this business. You know, these billions of dollars that you're, or trillion, six trillion dollars you talked about. Uh, <laughs> I mean, we'd love to all get a little piece of that pie. So, Francis, tell us where the trillions are stashed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think. No, I think that um, just talking about uh, workforce development in itself, um, 
I think one of our major problems, uh, quite frankly, is that we're not graduating enough people who are in the science uh, realm, you know, science, engineering, mathematics. And <laughs> talk about disincentives. I think um, there are an awful lot of disincentives uh, in, the, in the school system, whether it's, um, you know, lack of requirements in the secondary schools, and, um, well, not so much primary, but secondary schools, and then the cost of the uh, colleges and universities above that, you know, when I um, went to UC Berkeley, well, you know, um, millenn millennium ago, um, <laughs> it cost $238 a year, you know, and well, it was... Uh, it is big issue, of course, is just getting enough kids involved in science and engineering. Now, taking it the next step, let's say there are a few people out there that, that are kind of in the science, math, engineering field. How do we inveigle them into this world uh, and not have them go and work for, for Wall Street or, or something like that where they can make a hell of a lot more money, I think, and let far less, well, I don't know about far less risk. It depends on how far up the pecking order they are. Um, um, but I think that it would be really important for people to have access to uh, the challenges that are ahead. In other words, whether it's through these kinds of seminars or whether it's through, say, the SGIP, uh, DRGS, um, where we have discussions um, mostly with, with, you know, the, the experts in the field about various types of things. Um, get it out there that there are these challenges, and there are challenges from, you know, from the hardware to the software to the networks to the cybersecurity to policies and <laughs> businesses. So th they're all over the place, but it's rather hidden. I mean, it's just not that visible. Um, I will say that when I first started in this business, and if I, you know, was asked at a party what I did for a living, I would sort of, you know, if I said, well, I work, uh, you know, for in the electric utility world, it'd sort of be this, oh, okay. <laughs> and, um, you know, the only thing I was able to say was, well, it keeps the light, you know, I try to keep the lights on. Oh, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you're keeping the lights on. You know. Now, with the word smart grid, people and smart meters, are, people are beginning to say, oh, you're doing something like that, and, you know, renewable energy and so forth. But it's still pretty vague out there. And I think the more we can get out and make it visible at the college level, you know, at even the secondary and somewhat the primary level, if we can make it more visible that energy is a key element, climate change is a key thing that they're going to have to be dealing with, and energy is a part of that. If we can make it more visible, then I think we'll get the better brains to come and help us out. So I, I, I agree with what uh, Francis said, and, and I just I give a, a view from kind of a top level in terms of where I think that, that people are coming through the educational system right now where they should be uh, uh, pointing themselves, and I, and I think you know Francis really hit it really well. If you're if you're technically minded, there is a huge amount of, of opportunity at the utilities. Uh, they've got a lot of people who are hitting retirement age on the on the power engineering side of things. So if power engineering is something that is of interest to you, you can have no problem getting a job at a utility, and, and they're good jobs. Um, the, uh, the, the California Public Utilities Commission and some of the policymaking bodies also have a lot of opportunities. And if you're minded, you know, if you're of the mind where you like policy, uh, uh, then, and, and I, I love policy. I think that's really exciting. I would advise people to take a look at the opportunities at, at, at places like the California Public Utilities Commission. Um, for folks who are kind of second career people, which I think is, is probably most of the people in Irfan's class, um, and I, you know, I think you're doing the right thing. 
you're, 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 you've got a huge benefit having a person with the tremendous experience that Irfan has, you know, taking his time and energy and expertise to help train you uh, and, and transition you into kind of the new energy economy. Um, so you're doing the right thing by taking advantage of that. If you want to take that education to an additional level of, of expertise, um, one of the things I advise people, and, and there's not everybody can do this, but if you have the, 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 the wherewithal to, to force yourself to do it, go follow the proceedings that are of interest to you at the California Public Utilities Commission. All of the documents are, are, are public. <laughs> and you will not learn a topic as well as you will learn it by following a proceeding at the at the yeah, CPUC, California Public Utilities Commission. It is it's not the easiest documents, you know, to they're not they're not the most exciting documents to read, but you will come out of it an expert. And believe me, if you have that kind of expertise, you're valuable to companies. Because any company that is going to be in this business as the policy is innovating, the policy is in, in a state of flux. The, the technology is following the, the, the business model is going to follow the policy. So if you want to be in this business, if you understand where the policy is going, then you're valuable. You're valuable to, to companies, and, and that's where the job is going to be. So that, that's an additional place for you to get, get some training that's going to be really useful, practically useful to companies. So I, I think it's also about creating excitement and uh, I know I go back to my alma mater, Stanford, and all of a sudden, things like electrical networks and energy, that sort of thing, are the hot topics, and I'm all kinds of very, very smart people working on this problem. And, you know, that's a place, uh, among other universities, where you got you created Google and Yahoo and Facebook out of there, and we have to, it's getting to the point now where it's much more exciting to create uh, you know, smart energy networks and, and social networks. And I think that maybe maybe that would plateau, and all the smart people and investors will start going into smart energy networks. We can all go. All right. Very, very good. Well, because of the lateness of the hour, and to out of respect for our host here at IBM, who has provided us this facility, I just want to make some concluding remarks. I want to thank. Francis Cleveland and Ed Cazalet and Craig Lewis for participating in our panel uh, discussion. There are some questions that are here online and I'm going to provide them to Francis so that she can respond to them by email so that we have an efficient use of time. Some concluding uh, remarks. Uh, our next uh, seminar is going to be on July 23rd and Ahmed Farouki of the Brattle Group is going to speak about dynamic pricing and demand response. And he's going to bring some case studies from his own work at utilities to show how effective they've been or how not so effective they've been and what are some of the lessons learned. So I would encourage you to put this on your calendar now because you've got a whole month to say no to everyone else for July 23rd. <laughs> And then try to be here, and because your physical presence, I mean, while I appreciate the people on the webinar, some cannot travel here, but if you can physically make it, now you know where the parking lot is nestled <laughs> underneath this building without any signage or anything. So next time it'll be just so much easier. Some concluding uh, points on the discussion today. We made the case that distributed energy resources is a must-have going forward mm -hmm. and that it is a layered problem and there are needs uh, to understand the FIMAC layer for DER in the communication stack so that you know the, all the different flavors and try to work on the standards to establish them whether wired or wireless. There needs to be some kind of a networking protocol in the middle to route traffic to these field equipment in order to control them. There needs to be an application layer. People talk about enterprise service buses or service-oriented architecture to have various points connected seamlessly with each other without having to worry about the lower layers. That's the ESP concept. And then there has to be the proper sizing and configuration of databases 
because remember, we're moving to a distributed intelligence network, not just distributed energy resources. You're not going to have central vats of data and some kind of mainframe with links running back and forth. You want to make sure that the network is as modular as can be. So if a wide area network gets cut because of a disruption, like a natural disaster or a coordinated attack, that it can continue working. So start thinking about your skill set and how you can fit into this. So database management is going to be key. Architecting the proper applications that are light, nimble, you know, that you can distribute out there. And then having this transactive uh, energy concept, being able to develop the policy framework that will support that, being able to develop the applications that can support it. I mean, you can have the best policy, but if the application is not there, I mean, like, if you look at how much effort Ed and his team at uh, TMEX have done in creating these platforms, this is going to be important. So organizations like IBM and others who are involved in this data integration are going to play a key role, and you can help contribute there. And then you have all these vendors out there that are making products. So I'm going to tell you something that attorneys teach each other. Chase the ambulance, right? That's what attorneys yeah, teach each money. other, follow the money, right? So I'll show you how to chase ambulances in smart energy. Look out there at the major venture capitalists. There are plenty in the Bay Area. They're all over the country. Look at who are they funding. And look at what round of funding. There is always one round that gets into the commercial arena, you know, when they start commercializing the product. That's usually when they need to grow their teams in order to meet customer demand. Look for those companies and proactively approach them. The standard thing is, oh, just go to the utility and apply to the website. I'll tell you, it goes into some kind of an abyss. <laughs> it does. And then if you surface out of it, you know, it's like in the Middle Ages when they used to use the ducking chair and then they would pull the person out and then they would know, oh, whether this was a witch or was it a good person. So you, you don't want that kind of treatment, okay? Be proactive in your job search. And the reason why I'm telling you this is because I'm a recovering nuclear engineer in the smart grid field. Okay, so I have had to reinvent myself multiple times in order to keep food on the table. And I will tell you, these are some of the creative ways that you go out, look at the events parts of companies on their website, see what they're involved in, engage yourself with the subject matter experts that are leaders in these companies with a discussion, not about a job, but about a subject to pique their interest, because that's how you make the emotional deposits in them that you will later cash in the form of a job, or if not a job, Maybe a consulting engagement, or maybe they'll pull you into some kind of a nonprofit organization to do some work. But there are many, many ways to do it than just the standard corporate website and going and filling out a form. So keep those ideas in mind. Next month, as I said, the dynamic pricing and demand response is going to be quite creative. We are also going to have a webinar, as I always do. I have a webinar and a seminar, and next month, webinar which will occur on the second Monday of July, which I believe is the 9th of July, we are going to have uh, a very detailed technical dive into the internet protocol as it pertains to the electric grid. So everything you wanted to know about IP but were afraid to ask because, you know, the answer would be, well, IP has it, you are going to get answers and you're going to get a reality check on the internet protocol. And I really encourage you to participate and learn from the experts who are in this business what the internet protocol has to offer Smart Grid and what are some of the challenges. So with that, I'm going to, uh, yeah. if I can. I just, I just wanted to say, if you look at this, this is the website oh. of the DRGS Doug. Uh, this is where a lot of the conversations go on here. There's a number of subgroups. There's also the main group. I think this, and you can also find a lot of other people uh, on the, you know, during the calls or, or um, involved in this effort. And that may also trigger, you know, 
gee, I'm working on eMERGE and doing all of this sort of stuff, or I'm working on that, and maybe you, that will give you um, an idea of, of something uh, that you might want to follow. So this is, I think, a very good group uh, to just use as, as a trigger uh, for f more information, clearly, but also for connections. And actually, the easiest way to get here, you have to sign up to get on this cookie. So go www.nist.gov slash smart grid and go to this wiki collaboration link. Then you have to sign up for the cookie or the wiki access. Then you would <laughs> get you it. So you can contact us. Yeah, right. you can, you can, see, you can oh. see the pages without <laughs> signing up for anything. That's right. Oh yeah. yeah, you can see the pages. Oh yeah, you can see oh, the pages. Thought, you, really? yeah. But that might change January 1st. Right? Yeah. No. Well, yeah, yeah. maybe. So but uh, anyway, so I think that just just getting there, and then you can sign up for, that's where you would sign up, put in your email address if you want to actually join the group. Yeah. There's, the a, there's a link there somewhere. The SGIP is a wonderful forum to connect with subject matter experts to act as your coaches for job searches. And I say coaches, that doesn't mean they have the job for you. But you will have a very unstructured way in which you can communicate with them. If you try to go in through the front door of their corporations, it'll be an uphill battle. But over here, their guard is low because they are trying to collaborate and create something for the industry. So uh, once again, thank you very much. A uh, round of applause to the panelists. And we can close the Yes, so uh, with this, I'm going to now end uh, the recording. And if uh, those of you who are concerned about slides and all of those, uh, webcast recording link and the slides will be sent in that document that I keep updating. So you're going to have all the great links. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you.